for the meetings get extended by some 10 15 minutes and that's why so thank you very much for uh, patiently waiting and uh, having come here in this afternoon so let me jump straight into uh, the topic so this presentation will be there uh, for about 35 to 40 minutes, then based on your interest, we can have a Q&A session. Okay? You can ask me anything on any topic related to this, you know, this theme, not just on this presentation. Okay. So, why are we suddenly talking about Swarajya and Indian history? You may be wondering, what is really the occasion? You know, everything uh, needs an occasion. So as it happens, this year is the 350th year of Swarajya. So in the introduction it was announced that I write for Swarajya magazine, uh, swarajyamag.com, you can visit the website. It's a very good magazine uh, you know, which, which has a lot of articles and opinions on current affairs, society, economy and all that. So the current issue of this magazine is titled as 350 years of Swarajya, which is the name of the magazine itself. So they have nicely made it into a cover. And why did they put like this? Why, what is this 350 years of Swarajya? This year is the 350th anniversary of the coronation, the Rajya Vasheka of Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj. It is being observed by the Indian government and various organizations all over the country. If you have been following up the news, you would have seen uh, the message. But the actual day was on June 6th, but it is kind of being celebrated the whole year in a sense. Uh, so why, why the Raja Bhisheka of a king is such an important thing? There, there have been so many kings in India and all over the world. This particular event is a watershed moment in Indian history, as you will see. So it is obviously a great moment for celebration and also reflection. Celebration, why? Because, because uh, it's something about which all Indians will feel proud and joyous. And reflection, because how that event happened and what we can learn from it. So that sets the tone for this talk. You may be wondering, so we are all engineers, so we pursue science, technology and engineering. What has God, what has history got to do with us? It's, 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 it's not an academic discipline which we are after and what what is this Swarajya that has got to do with us? You know, when we say the word history, it becomes a very loaded word. Everyone thinks that history is always about past events, right? It is something not to be worried about. Because as youngsters, we are always looking forward to the future, not to the past. And if you are a very optimistic person, you, you always want to live in the present. So why care about the past? But history is not just past. And past is not something which you can simply wish away, you know. So even now when you when you go to an interview, the first thing they ask you is that what you have done so far, right? So it is an event where you are looking, uh, it is about your future. The first thing they ask you is what you have done in the past. And every bio data or resume is about the past. So you, you obviously your present and future is very much anchored in the past. So you cannot simply wish that away. And it is the history which gives you, gives anyone the sense of the self. So as an individual, so you, you always, you know, when you, when you want to introduce yourself in a big uh, uh, audience or, or in any gathering, you always mention about, you, you put yourself in front of that audience based on your history, right? So history is something which creates the sense of self and from the self comes self-esteem, self-worth, self-confidence and everything. 
So if this is the case for an individual, what to speak of society, what to speak of the nation? So every nation also has its own self, right? Just like an individual. And that self is not just built on geography. So you take uh, India. So India has a definitive geography from Himalayas to Kanyakumari, north to south, and Kutch to Kamaru, west to east. But is just that landmass India? No, because a, a nation is not just geography or a landmass. It is something more. It is the shared past of the people who have been living in this landmass for not 200, 300, 400, close to 5,000 years, a country like India. So it is defined by the civilization, the history of 5,000 years that has passed in this country. So that's where the history comes in. So it is not just geography, it is also the history that defines a nation. And through this history, a culture gets shaped. And that culture is very much part of the self of the nation. So the, the word uh, in Sanskrit, sva, is the word that, uh, that defines the self, right? So Swarajya literally means self-rule. That's how it, it is linked to the history. And it is not just past, it is inspiration for the present and the future. And it, it very much has got contemporary relevance. And that's why we are talking about it. You see the picture on the, on the left side. So that's a beautiful Bharat Mata painting by Abhinindranath Tagore in 1905. He was the brother of Rabindranath Tagore, a, a great Bengali painter. See how he has depicted Bharat Mata. So this very idea of Bharat Mata, does it have, if you see the other painting, there is simply no indication of geography. There is no India map there, right? But he, he titled the painting as Bharat Mata. So he portrayed her as a Devi. So she has uh, uh, some plants signifying prosperity. She has a book signifying knowledge. And she has the Japamala signifying spiritual, uh, spirituality, spiritual vision. And uh, she is clad in saffron, which, which is a color of renunciation and sacrifice. So this is how the great Bengali painter conceived Mother India. So there, he has fused culture, civilization, spirituality, everything, and created a very powerful symbol. In fact, that was one of the very earliest portraits of Bharat Mata. And then, on the other side, you see a very popular portrait, which you see in many places. So that has uh, the map of India portrait, and a lion signifying the strength, and a fire around the halo around the face of the Bharat Mata, signifying you know illumination, knowledge, and everything. So this is how the nation, any nation, gets defined, and that's why we, being the citizens, proud citizens of this nation, it's very important for us to contemplate on history and Swarajya. Coming to Swarajya, it's not a modern concept, at least for India. You know, the concept of self-rule. Nothing modern about it. So the word Swarat is uh, referred in the Vedas itself. So Sharaf Parama Swarat says a mantra. So Samrat, Swarat, Virat. There are three, all these three words. They come from the root word Rat, which in Sanskrit it comes from Raja. It is related to the ruler, the king. So Samrat is the king. Who, who rules all. Okay? So some generally means togetherness. And Virat means large. He has a grand vision. He always thinks large. And Swarat means that he is a sovereign. He, he, he has self-control. He, you know, there is a sense of self embedded in, in that person's rule. So this idea of Swarajya is mentioned in our ancient Indian scriptures at two levels. One is at a philosophical level, the other is at the political level. At the philosophical level, 
every person has a self right so we are we are uh, so we have this body which has all you know the, the senses and everything we have a mind which has emotions but behind this body and mind there is the atman which is the self and which is really the ruler of this whole body mind complex so philosophically the idea of swarajya is embedded in every individual so that's a philosophical idea then you take the same idea at a political social level so if your country is ruled with a, with its sense of self that is swaraj okay? if your society lives according to a principle which is embedded in itself that is swaraj if there is a, a outside influence if, or if there is a foreign idea or concept or rule takes over it then you have lost your swarajya and you have to really fight to regain it back just like you fight to regain yourself back so at a practical level what does it mean so resist and fight forces that are against the self that's what is fighting for swaraj so if we see if we see ancient history of india from about 2300 years back itself this whole thing started so so one of the very first invasions into india was from the greeks right so we have heard the story of how pururava stood up to alexander that alexander who claimed he hasn't faced any defeat anywhere he went he had to come to india and he had to go back on the way he died that's the story. so pururava stood up to save god the self swaraj and immediately after that we know about the maurya empire chanakya and chandragupta right chandragupta was a was a boy he was not a prince or born of a very high lineage in fact uh, his mother who, who was named mora she was selling peacock feathers so born to such born in such a family chanakya took him groomed him and made him into a great king and he fought back the greek forces and sent them back and then the greeks eventually relented and they made a uh, agreement with him and the greek princess was married to chandragupta you know that story and then we have vikramaditya who valiantly fought the shakas so shakas were another tribe from the north west fr- frontier so who invaded india and the gupta king vikramaditya fought them back and yashodharma and baladitya so they fought another barbaric tribe which invaded india the hunas so yashodharma is mentioned as hunajit in all the books all the, the historical record that talk about it so all these tribes that invaded india india the india's uh, swarajya you know the, the kings who wanted to protect swarajya they fought these forces back and they assimilated some of them they got indigenized and then we when we come to medieval times we have barbaric invasions from the desert lands of the middle east the arabic and the turkish uh, regions there were invasions so there was plunder there was destruction of culture forced conversions enslavement tyrannical rule subjugation all this was there we we read about this in the history but it was not an easy job for the invaders you know uh, we are just told that muhammad bin qasim invaded india and then the india just fell to foreign rule that's not true in fact uh, uh, one of the books that i mentioned there uh, by sitaram goel it says it took no less than 600 years for the invaders to move from sindh to delhi imagine it's not a very big distance the same arabic and turkish forces when they went to the other side they enslaved uh, persia which is today's iran and egypt and syria and all those countries within 50 years okay so those countries had their own ancient cultures within 50 to 100 years they subjugated all of that they converted this whole land but in india just to come from the periphery to the center it took 600 years so there was relentless heroic resistance from our our people our ancestors to stop the foreign rule but unfortunately 
you know the history has its own course so ultimately they got power and there was a tyrannical rule from delhi for the next 300 400 years uh, but ultimately the invaders could never capture india fully because had they captured india fully today india will be like iran we won't even be speaking our languages our names would have been different just imagine see this is where hypothetically if you think if this had not happened we won't even look like this, you know, the kind of dresses we wear and everything. Just coming to think of it. So, so in medieval times, the fight for Swarajya was on. And then, I don't have to tell you about Vijayanagar Empire. Uh, our own Karnataka is a pride of our state, Karnataka. So this empire, it shielded and protected South India from the invasions and the foreign troops. And it established Swarajya in this region, and because, because of which, because of its strength, there was all around the prosperity, peace, development, art, culture, literature, everything flourished. It was like it is still remembered by us as the golden period of the history of South India, okay? those 300 years of Vijayanagar. But if you see the rise and fall of this empire, there are lessons to learn. So, how was this empire established? So prior to the establishment of this empire, Malik Ghafur, who was the commander-in-chief of Alauddin Khilji, he came with big armies to South India and he defeated all the king kingdoms. Right? So he defeated Kakatiya kingdom of Warangal, Hoysala kingdom of Dwarasamudra, and the Pandya kingdom of Madurai. He went all the way up to Rameshwar, almost the southern tip, looted so much of gold and wealth from South India and uh, appointed uh, some local rulers and went away. And these rulers were generally ravaging South India for, for a few decades. And uh, two brothers, Hakka and Bukka, they are called uh, you know, in colloquial Kannada, from the Kompili Rajya, they were taken as slaves to Delhi. They got converted. But then within some 20, 30 years, there was a big rebellion in the Kompili region. And the Sultan, just didn't know how to control it because the, 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 the persons whom he appointed locally could not control it. So he sent those two brothers. So now go back to your area from Delhi. You know, you bring it under control. The moment these people landed into that region, uh, the, the, their old capital was Anegundi, right? which is in the current day Hampi. The moment they saw the culture still alive, they just, you know, they just came back to their mother religion immediately. They reconverted. In fact, they were one of the very first Ghar Vapasi episodes in our history, <laughs> which we are not told. So they fell they at the feet of Vidyaranya, uh, who was the Shankaracharya of Shingeri Peetha. He blessed them. In fact, they were, again, like Chandragupta, they were not from some great royal clan or anything. They were very ordinary warriors of the hill tribe. Even their names, Hakka and Bukka, right? So they were given names like Harihara, and Booker Raya later and made the rulers and they established this glorious capital and named it as Vijayanagara and Vidyanagara. 300 years that, that empire flourished. Almost the entire South India and also the western and eastern seas, the sea trade was under its control. But then slowly, you know, the complacency. Too much of Swarajya makes people a bit lazy and lethargic and disunity started setting in and the enemies who were waiting to destroy this uh, kingdom, with a united force, they attacked it, and the empire fell in the battle of Tal Tal Talikota, or Tangadi Yutta, it is called. So, there is a big lesson there. But then, whatever the influence of that empire that was set in, it did not die down. There were Nayaka kings all over South India, ruling in many portions. There were Tanjavur Nayakas, Madurai Nayakas, Kelaji Nayakas, Chittadurga, everywhere the Nayaka kingdoms were there. And they maintained the Swarajya at the local level. So now we come to our main topic, Shivaji. So Shivaji was born at a time when the Vijayanagara Sam, uh, Samrajya had collapsed. So in the Delhi, there was the rule of Aurangzeb the most tyrannical ruler of the Mughal dynasty. At the south, there was Adil Shah of Bijapur. 
and to the west the, uh, there was an African uh, Siddhi ruler who was ruling the coastal areas. So Shivaji's father, Shahaji, he himself was employed as an officer in the army of Bijapur Sultan. So because of uh, a few centuries of uh, uh, colonization, Though these people were great warriors, they lost all the will and inspiration to fight. They just started serving as officers in the, in the armies and courts of the sultans. So much of India was under foreign rule. There were atrocities on Hindus. In fact, we have a lot of contemporary records from the writings of Marathi saints like Nyaneshwar, Namdev, Eknath. So how, what were the kind of atrocities? They, they couldn't go to pilgrimage spots, they couldn't worship in the temples. They, people couldn't even conduct weddings in the open. So, at that point of history, Shivaji was born in a fort called Shivaneri Durg in the year 1630. And uh, his father was always, you know, on uh, some battles or on official work. He was traveling around. So it was his mother who brought him up, almost entirely. So the great valiant mother, she transformed his son into a dharmic fighter, leader, and emperor. In fact, uh, we call Jijabai as Veera Mata. She was not an ordinary woman. Uh, at a very young age, Shivaji started asking questions. So why should I fight others' battle? See, many times, so this is again a, a question for many of us. Many of us are fighting others' battle instead of fighting our own battle. Right? So he, he thought about what his father was doing. And when he came to know about the circumstances that led their family into such a thing, he decided, I am not going to be like my father. You know, this is very interesting. So generally, children tend to emulate their father. But here Shivaji decided, I am not going to be like my father. I am not going to become an officer of a sultan or a shah or somebody. I am going to fight for freedom. So Jijabai told him the stories of Ramayana and the Mahabharata. We have read about it. I have put, this is from the Amar Chitra Katha. So evocatively and beautifully. So she, uh, Jijabai tells him about the teaching of the Gita that every person has to do his swadharma, the duty. And then he asked, what is my duty? And out of his own thinking, you know, all the values he has got, and independent thinking, he decides this. And the mother encourages it. So she doesn't dissuade him. He says, oh, you are taking a risky path. Don't do that. In fact, she encourages him. She says, your duty lies in fighting for your people. So that's how the great warrior is born. And uh, I'm not going to go too much into the biographical details, which uh, I recommend that you read Amar Chitra Katha. It's beautiful. There are multiple titles on Shivaji. There is one Shivaji, and then Tales of Shivaji. There is one on Tanaji, and a few other titles. So just at the age of 15, you know, which is the age less than everyone in this room, so, it is the age at which people write their 10th standard exam. So, Shivaji put his vision into action. So, he gathered a band of his friends, give them, you know, trains in, in weaponry and war, guerrilla warfare. And he started taking control of the multiple forts. Torangad is one of the first, and then the Purandargad, and then Raigad, one by one. If I don't know if any of you have gone to uh, Pune and the surrounding areas. In fact, I have done trekking uh, to some of these guts. They are wonderful. Great, uh, they are very scenic spots. You know, of course, trekking has its own joy and thrill, but you learn so much about the history. How strategically these hills and forts are located. You can visualize. In fact, if, if you have some good knowledge of history and imagination, you can actually, the moment you step into that territory, you can start living the life of Shivaji. How he could have planned the attacks, how he could have controlled these forts. 
In fact, in one of my treks, I actually did a night trek to Thorangal. Stayed there overnight. In the morning, we started through the hill route. We went to Raigad. We started at 6, 6.30 a.m. in the morning and reached the Raigad at 6.30 in the evening. 12 hours of walking through the hill route and stayed in that fort that day, in the next day. It was, it was one of the greatest experience in my life. And then the battle of Pratapgad, how he defeated the treacherous Afzal Khan. You know, the Bijapur Sultan gets too much worried about Shivaji capturing four. So he, he asks his commander Afzal Khan to go eliminate Shivaji. So Afzal Khan comes towards the Pratapgad fort. And Shivaji is well secured in the fort. So he wants to provoke Shivaji. So en route, he passes through the village called Tulajapur, which has the temple of Bhavani, the Kuladevata of Shivaji, a much a deity uh, to whom he is very fond of. So he orders his armies to completely destroy that temple, thinking that the, because the temple gets destroyed, Shivaji will get angry. He will come out of the fort. But in spite of such a grave provocation, no, Shivaji gets very much, he, his mind is agitated, but still he is very composed. He says, if we come out, that's it, the enemy is going to kill us. Because he has an army which is numerically much stronger. In fact, if you read the, the history books, they give how much of infantry and cavalry each army had. Uh, Shivaji's army was only about 40% of the size of Afzal Khan's army. Their only strengths were guerrilla warfare and of course the zeal to fight for dharma. That's what drove them. And uh, you know the famous story of how Afzal Khan wanted to kill Shivaji by stealth embrace and how Shivaji went with the armor and uh, a tiger's claw, right? Vaganaka. And he, uh, so during the embrace, Shivaji just pierced his flesh. Uh, Khan's flesh through the, those nails, through a dagger, he killed him. And when the army got to know of this, they started attacking. But the, the Shivaji's army was then prepared. And then there was battle of Kolhapur and Simhagad. The stories of each of the conquests of Shivaji, very inspired. In fact, every, every story of conquest is accompanied by a story of sacrifice. In the case of Simhagad, Tanaji, who is called to fight, you know, uh, his son's wedding is there the very next day. He is called in. And he comes, he captures the fort, but then he dies. And in the case of Afzal Khan, uh, I, I forget the name of one of the uh, account, uh, one of the people accompanying Shivaji. He was a barber. So he puts his life at risk to save Shivaji. He was not even a fighter, you know. He is accompanying the army to, to do the barber's work. But he puts his life at risk to save his master. So that is the, the inspiration that Shivaji put into everyone who came into contact with him. That, that's the sign of a great leader. And then Shivaji's daring escape from Aurangzeb's prison at Agra. So we all know that he wants to distribute lettuce and those boxes are brought in. And uh, in some stories, it's fruits. So it gets into there. And the people around the Agra region, right? they put their lives at so much risk to assist Shivaji in this escape operation. Imagine, Shivaji is not even from that region. Shivaji is a Maratha, right? Where, where is Pune uh, or Satara and where is Agra? But there are people who are empathetic to his cause in that region, right, right at the epicenter of the Mughal Empire, putting their lives at risk to help Shivaji escape. And then Shivaji proclaimed Hindavi Swarajya in the year 1964. There was a traditional Raja Abhishek, you know. In fact, uh, it is said that people had almost forgotten how the Raja Abhishek of a Hindu king happens. Because every Hindu king was getting defeated and they were only seeing some sultans and alangirs taking into the crown, 
taking the crown and people had nearly forgotten and then shivaji conducted his traditional raja abhishek in a very grand manner and this hindavi swarajya in fact shivaji uses his very word hindavi swarajya which can be translated as indian self rule or hindu self rule whatever way you translate it uh, in 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 a letter that he writes to one of his commander he has used this very word uh, and then when he becomes the king he he proclaims his rule as hindavi swarajya and jagannath sarkar uh, the famous historian says the coronation of the coronation of shivaji has shown that the tree of hinduism is not really dead but like the akshaya vata tree of allahabad it can spring forth new leaves and raise its head to the skies again that's how the great historian great so this is why this event is so important you know we gave so much of hope to the whole nation and shivaji is hindu swarajya what were its how how did it start originally so there was upsurge of bhakti movement in maharashtra as a precursor to shivaji's birth if you go two centuries back there was gnaneshwar there was eknath these were great saints who wrote this uh, powerful bhakti poetry called abhang just like we have dasas in karnataka and nayanmars and alwars in tamil nadu we had these great saints in maharashtra simple poetry so that gave hope to people even when they they were living under cruel tyrannical rule so this this movement had slowly spread the bhakti movement had spread to all the villages uh, and many regions of maharashtra where where people uh, people gained self confidence you know in their life that's the most important in the society and then slowly when shivaji started his mission there was already the inspiration in people mind and they it 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 helped them to join shivaji's mission and directly in fact sant tukaram and samarth ramadas were shivaji's contemporaries so he took spiritual guidance from them directly uh, sitting at their feet so hindavi swaraj was propelled by the power of ordinary people six not just you know a king sapata uh, vishaka of a king no it was very different from all the the stories of monarchy that we have heard in india or elsewhere it was power of ordinary people peasants and poets mystics and militia built with you know the boys uh, ordinary people it's a very It's a more important egalitarian movement if you see from the world history perspective compared to French Revolution, which happened about uh, 100 years, 150 years later, or the Renaissance Enlightenment ideas of the West. So till till the Renaissance came in, the Western society was very hierarchical. You know? They they never had this concept of egalitarianism. So equality. fraternity liberty these ideas were slowly coming into the european society only around that time but even a hundred years before that shivaji had built hind hindavi swarajya on these ideas how in fact uh, we have a, a lot of historical evidence for this so shivaji's whole setup social inclusion and mobility was very much a part of that inclusion of different communities in the army and administrative setup this again uh, marathas these were all different communities kolis brahmins soldiers from many communities mahar mam gramoshi and other tribal communities together they fought for shivaji in his army and he in the in the traditional one of the traditional titles for all indian kings is go brahmana pratipalaka which means someone who protects brahmanas and cows so you may ask in the first bullet you say there is social mobility in the second bullet you say he is the protector of brahmanas 
What does that mean? That really means protection of the weak. You know, it's a term. The Go Brahmana Pratipalaka literally means the king will protect all the weak. Why? Because traditionally, but by the time of Shivaji, Brahmanas had become warriors. But traditionally in the Indian society, it was said that they are not supposed to carry weapons. Right? They are not supposed to attack anyone, live a very simple life as teachers and gurus and purohits, etc. So it just signifies that they are weak people. So the king will protect the weakest, similar to the cow. So cow is not like a lion or tiger, which will attack you. Right? So it is a very innocent animal in the Indian tradition. Uh, we have even proverbs in our Indian languages. Oh, he is like a cow, right? For a very innocent person, we say that. So uh, the protector of cows literally means that, of course, it is the animal cow, which anyway has a very important place in the agriculture and the you know, Indian economy traditionally. But it is also a symbol of uh, when a king proclaims that he protects the cows, and the brahmanas, it means that he is, he is the protector of the weakest people in the society. That's all it means. And respect for uh, all women and children, including those of the Indians. In fact, uh, when, the, when the Mughal and the Islamic invaders, when they go capture uh, a kingdom, we have, we have heard stories how they enslaved the woman and all that. right? But Shivaji, being a very dharmic king, even when his soldiers brought captured women in front of him, there are incidents where he falls at their feet and then apologizes on behalf of his soldiers that they, you know, if they have misbehaved with you, you know, uh, I apologize. And then respectfully he sends them back to their relatives. So this was the, this was the ethical and dharmic framework of Shivaji. And within his own kingdom, there were was, there was strict rules against molesting the woman and anybody uh, who, who, uh, who indulges in violence against uh, women, they were very severely punished. And uh, the sati custom was very prominent uh, in some, particularly among the royal communities in those days. So when Shivaji's mother, mother wanted to do sati, commit sati, when Shivaji's father died, he prevented her saying that, you know, don't, don't give in to the old custom. You are such a great woman with so much intellect and you need to live and guide us. And she heeded to his request. So she didn't commit sati. And in fact, Shivaji had an informal order to discourage women from committing sati all through his kingdom. Just another, you know, in the, uh, if you come to the 18th century, during the rule of Peshwas, who were the kings, uh, who were the successors of Shivaji, right? So Shivaji, Sambhaji, and then the line, and then the Peshwa rule takes over. Peshwas passed an order of banning Sati all through their kingdom. It is, it is well recorded in history. So we are told that only when the British came, uh, you know, through the efforts of people like Raja Ram Mohan Roy, Sati was abolished. Maybe that was the case only with respect to Bengal where that custom uh, was prominent. But the Peshwas had already banned Sati 100 years before the British could even think about it. And uh, uh, decolonization was another project. So during the Mughal rule, the entire administrative setup had Persian and Arabic languages creeping into it. See, even today, we use words like Vaki, you know, for a, for a barrister, it's actually a Persian word. Uh, there are so many Persian words, even in languages like Kannada. Uh, how it came? Because during the Muslim rule, the Indian languages were suppressed and only Persian and Arabic were used as a court language. Shivaji undertook a reform of making a Raj Vyavahar Kosh, making a Marathi as the language of administration and removing the influence of Persian Arabic. Uh, again, there is another famous uh, proclamation from Shivaji, abolition of slave trade. In fact, he warned Europeans against conducting slave trade in his territories. So there were Portuguese, Portuguese Dutch and French people uh, doing trade in the coasts of India at that time. They were indulging in slave trade 
and Shivaji issued stern warning to them. And the naval force of Shivaji, the navy, uh, he had great maritime ambitions. You would have seen the recent news, this, this insignia. So this is actually taken from Shivaji's Rajamudra. The Indian government has adopted it. So I will conclude my speech with a few, uh, you know. So is it that uh, Shivaji is overpraised? Is there any exaggeration in what I said? This is not just, you know, what I said. So what some of the great leaders of the Indian freedom movement have said. So with that I end my talk. Bal Ganga Dhar Thilak, we all know. Swaraj is my birthright. Uh, that's what he said. He called Shivaji as a great vibhuti, means a divine force. And he, he started the Shivaji Utsav all through the Maharashtra to celebrate Shivaji. Uh, Rabindranath Tagore. So he said that Shivaji was, you know, not just some local kingdom builder. So what Shivaji did, it was an all India project. That was very much true because in the next century, the, the Maratha Empire expanded from Tanjavur in the south to Kabul in the north. Uh, the 18th century is being called as the Maratha century by the historians. So it was truly an all India project. Swami Vivekananda. So there's an interesting episode. So in one of uh, the meetings with his disciples in Madras, so people had come to listen to some great spiritual truths from this, this young sannyasi, you know, who speaks great English, well educated. There are doctors and other prominent personalities. The year was 1895. And Swamiji, he just sings a song. Indrajini Jambhapar, Vodavasu, Ambhapar, Ravana, Sadambhapar, Raghukula, Rajya Hai. The song starts like that. Tejitam, Anspar, Kanhajini, Kanspar, Tyom, Milecha, Banspar, Sher, Shiva, Rajya Hai. It ends like that. It is a Hindi poem. Which is extolling the the valor of Shivaji, so he sings this song. It all with some great rhythm. They all ask, "What is this song about?" Then he says, "It is about Shivaji." And then all those British English educated Doctor C. Nanjunda Rao, he says, "Oh, the textbooks speak of him as a robber and a marauder." That's how the British historians have written it. Then Swamiji sh shots back. Uh, I have given the full quote because it is so powerful. So he admonishes the doctor, saying, This is what comes of your reading Indian history written by foreigners. Who could have no sympathy with you? Nor could they have any respect for your culture, traditions, manners, and customs, which they could not understand. Is there a greater hero, a greater saint, a greater bhakta, and a greater king than Shivaji? Who says this? Swami Vekananda himself. Shivaji was the very embodiment of a born ruler of men as typified in your great epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. He was the type of the real son of India representing the true consciousness of the nation. So then the Swamiji's full speech, it's actually there as part of his complete work. And uh, is Shivaji just a Maratha hero? The moment you say Shivaji, oh he's a Maratha, why are you talking about him in Bengaluru? You know? These kind of silly questions people ask. Subramanya Bharati, the great Tamil poet, the national poet, he wrote his stirring poem, Shivaji's address to his army. Uh, it starts, Jaya Jaya Bhavani, Jaya Jaya Bharatam, like that it starts. Bharata Nadu, Parkalam, Tiragam, Niradam, Pudalvari, Ninevagatra Adir. So, the glory of the motherland call for struggle, sacrifice. In fact, even now, uh, any Tamil person, if he reads that poem, it, it causes goosebumps. Such a great poem it is, which Bharati wrote in Tamil on Shivaji. And there are many refer references to Shivaji in his essays and poems. And uh, Dr. Ambedkar, he, he, when he conducted this Mahat Satyagraha in 1927, you know, which was for claiming the rights for the people of all castes to use public places like wells and roads, so which was the slogan they were chanting in the procession? Shivaji Maharaj Ki Jai. So that was the chant that was heard in Ambedkar Satyagraha. 
and in the constitution assembly debate so in that moment a historic moment you know when the indian constitution is being tabled in the parliament ambedkar remembered shivaji so he said when shivaji was fighting for liberation the other people they were fighting battles on the other side of the mughal empire will history repeat itself why did he say because the partition had just happened okay it was 1947 and india was divided on the religious lines and he is tabling the constitution for uh, the new democratic republic called india and he remembered shivaji and this is a great quote from shri arvind is that that i in my talk the country whose young men are imbued with the glory of the past pain of the present and dreams of the future always moves on the path of progress thank you Thank you, sir. Thank you for your uh, insights on uh, Shivaji Maharaj. So we'll have a short Q and A session. Um, uh, okay, you can hear me, huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Good evening, sir. I'm Sadat Atmara, Telecommunication Department, yes. third, fourth semester. Uh, thing is that um, I just wanted to uh, thank you for coming and you know giving such a uh, insightful talk on people that aren't as glorified as they should be in in our history books per se, considering how as you know as you yourself as you 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 pointed out saying that history. I mean, I think um, it was. Swami Vivekananda himself said that history is being whitewashed by the by the foreigners themselves. Yeah. So it's nice to see that our own society is coming out to glorify our own people that are that are meant to be glorified yeah. at the stage such as this, and hopefully the future as well. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. Uh, it's a genuine set of questions which I've never actually, I guess, gotten the answer to, especially in the case of Shivaji. Yeah. Um, number one, I mean, considering that we are a democratic. nation at this point yes uh, republic um but majority of the great history of us has not revolved around democracy per se so what i mean i wanted to ask what form of governments was the shivaji administration solely built on and how have we as a conscience shifted from a great administration of shivaji to a republic as we are today see not just india right every country had monarchy till about 200 years back right so if so india is not isolated on that count but there is a big difference between the monarchy of india and the monarchy of all other countries this is again a topic in itself right. if you call me to talk uh, about it separately i'll come i'll just give you one example take one of our earliest epics ramayana right so when dashratha wants to make the prince rama as the king there is a big chapter on valmiki ramayana he calls everyone in the country there are representatives of various communities and the principalities he doesn't come and say that okay here is my son rama he is the king that's it just go before him no so there is a sense in of merit he, he yeah. asks the opinion of every one of them and all of them give some very good feedback about rama and then he says okay you all like rama so much now he will be the king right so the monarchy in india always has revolved around democratic principles see it may not be the kind of democracy that we have now in fact there was there was even process of election there, there you have the regarding the chola empire in tamil nadu there are some uh, 9th 10th century epigraphs in some temples uh, in uttarameru right our prime minister himself mentioned about it sometime back there is a procedure of how they were electing the gram panchayat leaders through just like we have we have the ballot system somebody has to write names in palm leaves and put in so on pot so be, so that there were experiments in democracy in indian history okay so it's not just like that it, it was not like a very tyrannical monarchy where one king will have a say 
Fair enough. Um, that was a genuine question. And the second one was, um, I myself have tried to join the defense and everything, which has gone its own form. I just wanted to ask, considering the fact that Shivaji has his, I guess, one of his greatest merits as a great naval commander, or um, a, a naval envisionary, I wanted to ask, considering that information wasn't as easy to get from foreign lands, like probably the Nordic areas or whatever, how did he get his um, ideas about naval warfare, about naval history, uh, the formation of ships, the formation of battle formations and everything? See, it just started during Shivaji's period, really. So he, he knew the importance of the naval force, but it really grew at a period after Shivaji. Okay. In fact, only during the Peshwas time, the, the Maratha naval force, uh, it grew into a very big fleet. So one of the main problem was pirates, right? So we have, we have seen so many Hollywood films about pirates are a big menace in all the coastal areas. So the main motivation was to control them. It was not really to capture new territories. But again, uh, once they built the naval fleet for that purpose, it helped to maintain uh, sovereignty over the coastal areas. So they had their own methods. See, uh, they may, it's, internet was not available, many other technologies that we have today, they were not available. But uh, if you read novels, or many, in fact, there are so many books written on the navigation itself, right? So traditionally, they had many methods uh, for navigation which they used. They were quite knowledgeable. In fact, Indians have been on the, the Indian navigation has a history of at least about 3,000 years, even, even before. Because uh, in the Harappa Mohanjadaro um, archaeological uh, remains, there are uh, proofs, uh, there are evidences for sea trade flourishing from ports like Lothal, which were on the seashore. So the knowledge, see, once a society acquires that knowledge, that stays, right? The traditional knowledge. Fair enough. Thank you, sir. Maybe give chance to other people also. There's no one else. Oh, okay. I mean, if there's anyone else, yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> um, in the beginning, sir, you said that um, the way society move, will move forward, uh, or at least Indian society will move forward in its required path, is if we um, govern ourselves under the clauses of the self, or to ent the way we, the only way we can ensure that we are Swarajya mm -hmm. is if we um, pertain ourselves to the clauses of the philosophy of the self. Right. Now, considering that, you know, society these days, it's not easy to, you know, we have such a polarized, um, I would say, idea of what society is and the kind of people that are there in society. What would you say are the points or the clauses of the philosophy of the self today? The society has to govern itself in to ensure that Swarajya is at, 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 you know, at its peak. Right. See, the, the, the words like polarization, etc. are very political and very mischievous and nefarious words. Okay. There is, uh, yeah, the political consolidation takes its own path, right? But ultimately, for, uh, for India to succeed and grow as a nation, Right? So, irrespective of whatever religion or community or region a person belongs to, the, the common principles that make, make India into a nation, everybody need to at least respect those concepts. See, for example, a person need not uh, put a picture of Rama and starts doing some dhupa dipa to that. So, th so that is a very religious adoration of the deity called Rama, right? But any person who is an Indian citizen, say, right, shouldn't he be aware of a great thing called Ramayana? See, Ra Ramayana is such a wonderful thing. I mean, there is no other country in the world 
that can boast of such a great epic which has been coming unbroken to us for more than 3000 years such a simple story such a human story you know a story of love a story of sacrifice valor uh, the brotherly love the love between uh, husband and wife the love between the brothers the father and son the king and the citizens and how rama at every moment so rama was not just a war hero right so he is a dharma dharmic hero so dhiro datta nayaka that's what they say in sanskrit so any person who who is a indian citizen shouldn't he at least be know about rama and respect the idea of rama because it is, it is an indian idea you know it's not just a religious idea in fact people from japan they have created the rama uh, ramayana animation movies right so this epic is so enchanting so captivating people from all over the world read it they want to learn from it why a person who is born in india just because he follows another religion should be hostile to the idea of rama even gandhi talked about rama rajya right so he was chanting the name of rama all through the time but those who take the name of gandhi now they are spreading very hateful uh, and uh, very contempt filled ideas about rama and ramayana why if you are a true gandhian go by what gandhi said right did gandhi hate rama no rama was an ideal for gandhi right so there is nothing called polarization uh, these are these are very uh, i very divisive ideas right so, so in indian culture and indian civilization has its icons its heroes its values so even all citizens of india should respect those ideals values and concepts so once you are very clear on this point this whole thing about polarization etc will not come isn't it uh, good evening sir i'm chinmay from third year engineering uh, my question to you is uh, we have discussed chatrapati shivaji maharaj in detail uh, can you discuss about the impact chatrapati shivaji maharaj has had on contemporary saints and uh, leading intellectuals of indian history and how they have come to uh, and how those opinions and thoughts have come to shape india the indian story today thank you yeah i gave a few names right i gave uh, i thought as I, i told vega swami vekananda uh, in fact sri aravindo's quote i put sri aravindo himself has written about shivaji he has written a very long poem called bhaji prabho Uh, about one of the commanders of shivaji it's again yet another story of sacrifice in one of shivaji's battles baji prabhu was a commander of shivaji uh, okay who else uh, if if, I, if we start taking name in fact uh, subhash chandra bose has spoken about shivaji he was a great inspiration veer savarkar has written in great details about shivaji Uh, Jawaharlal Nehru in his uh, discovery of India has praised the heroism of Shivaji so or uh, if you take uh, all the modern nation builders of India they all have derived inspiration from Shivaji right so see uh, he he is certainly one of the greatest icons of India no doubt about it thank you sir. any more questions <coughs> thank you sir thank you for your insights so i would like to thank you and uh, i would request our faculty coordinator uh, dr sujatha ma'am to uh, fel- felicitate uh, him with sampling so uh, this token of gratitude is 100% free of single use plastic and this is an event organized by isrc institute social responsibility cell So we request all of you to avoid single use plastic as much as possible. I would like to thank our uh, faculty coordinator Sujatha Ma'am who has helped us to organize this event. Um thank you ma'am. Uh, I would also like to thank all the core members of ISRC um uh, for helping us to organize the event 
and they have uh, they may few of them are present and few of them are not present but they have they had helped us they have helped us directly or indirectly so i would like to thank all of them thank you and yeah you people you audience are the most important people for this uh, event to be successful i would like to thank all of your uh, all of you and i would like to appreciate your presence and uh, please uh, be coming to the all the events of isrc and events organized by isrc thank you thank you one and all a special thanks to the uh, singers anirudh and shreya uh, for their beautiful song with very good lyrics thank you sir uh, guys can we have a group photo with uh, our honorable guest then uh, you people can you can move on yes sir uh, we